So this drawing is going to take up a lot of the screen and I'm probably going to have to erase and zoom in on certain things periodically. So just be prepared for that. Um, I don't recommend trying to keep up with screenshots, but you can if you wish, because I'm going to try and do this fast ish. But this first part, not so much. So I'm going to draw a brain. What? That was weird. It pulled up an icon from my desktop. Um, all right. So let's draw a cute little brain. There's our temporal lobe. And here's our cerebellum. And then we've got our pons, medulla, and brainstem. All right, not bad. Um, okay, so I'm going to draw a very important gyrus. Or, excuse me, very important sulcus. There's the central sulcus. And then let me highlight some necessary gyri. We're going to do. Come on now. Give me a larger dot, please. Thank you. We're going to give ourselves a nice little precentral gyrus, which is the home of the motor cortex. And then its corresponding association area. And then we'll do some labeling. Um, so actually, let's see, maybe I can do. Yeah, I'm going to make a key so I can use arrows for other things. Okay. Oops, one skinnier dot. If only I could just be wired up to this so that I could think what kind of mark I want to make and it would just happen. That would be great. Okay, so our purple area is our premotor cortex. And our pink area is our primary motor cortex. OK, so the premotor cortex is the location where motor programs are made. Motor programs meaning, uh, think about a really simple motion. For example, if you really think about it, no motion is simple, which is why I'm having a hard time thinking of this. Um, let's say pointing at something. So the steps included are typically raise your arm forward, keeping it straight. So you're engaging your triceps, brachii to keep your arm straight and you're engaging pectoral muscles to raise your arm. And then simultaneously you are flexing your flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus in your forearm that keeps your fingers down. You are flexing your extensor indices to keep your index finger pointed and you're engaging your flexor pollicis brevis and longus probably to keep your thumb in. So that produces a point. But if you do those in the wrong order, you don't point. You just spasm, you spasmically move your arms. So not only does contraction and muscle grouping matter, but the order of things matters as well. So if you think about movement too hard, you start to feel dizzy and afraid because, oh my God, it's complicated. And yet we take it for granted, which is crazy. So motor program means step one, do this. Step two, do this. And you have a map of your body on your brain so you can coordinate the pattern of movement that you need so that you can send it to the motor cortex. So program is sent from this brain region to this brain region. And it's sent in the form of action potentials, remember. So all of the arrows I'm drawing up right up here are volleys of action potentials being sent from one neuron to another. Now, make a different drawing here. Now we're going to look at a coronal section of the brain, and I'm just going to draw half of it. There's our insula. Here's our temporal lobe. There's our ventricle. 
Here's our third ventricle. Thalamus, yada, yada. Okay, so here we have our half of our brain. So we've got in the primary motor cortex what are called pyramidal cells. And pyramidal cells are called that because the cell bodies of these neurons look kind of like triangles. And these are the upper motor neurons. Uh, no, labeled lines is a peripheral nervous system thing. Um, we'll get to that later. Programming meaning the set of steps necessary to do a motor motion. So that's what I just described from pointing. A motor program is what muscles need to be contracted in what order to achieve a motion. So we're, we're not to either label blinds or dermatomes yet. And we won't get to dermatomes because that's a sensory division, not a motor thing. So these pyramidal cells, let's draw down here. We've got pons and medulla. Draw these. And then the medulla, we've got the pyramids on the front. So the upper motor neurons are from the pyramidal cells. So they get excited one after the other in the necessary order to produce a movement. And then since I've drawn everything else in pink, I'm actually gonna redraw the upper motor neurons in a different color so that we can more easily trace their path because everything being pink isn't helpful. So these are going to join in tracts and they are going to descend down. And once they get to the pyramids, they go to the other side. So what that means is information that is originating in the left brain is controlling the right side of the body and vice versa. So this little step on over to the other side, we call the accusation of the pyramids. So it sounds like a very grandiose fancy term, but all it really means is on the way down, motor neurons go to the opposite side of the body. And the, the place they do that is in the pyramids of the medulla oblongata. Awesome. Okay, so then this neuron group I'm just uh, sort of condensing them into one because I don't want to spend time drawing all of them. Is going to continue down and let's say I'm doing my pointing thing. So they are going to synapse on a slice of spinal cord, which I must now draw real quick. Okay. So I'm going to draw it. this. There's the anterior median fissure, central canal. And we've got our horns there. Give me just a minute to color them in and look at some other stuff and then we'll uh, pause the drawing and move it over. So All righty. So
There we've got our gray matter, which is where synapsing is going to happen. And I gotta finish my thing. And then I'm gonna pick, oh, I have to pick the, it's important that I pick the correct side. So they're gonna just send in, oops, wrong yellow. The lateral corticospinal tract. Um, so that's the white part of the spinal cord. Um, and then they're gonna synapse at whatever the appropriate level is. So I'm guessing that this spinal cord um, slice is probably in the brachial plexus area because I'm talking about an arm motion. So we're gonna have it synapse here on a cell body of a somatic motor neuron in the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord. And I'm gonna, well, this is a multipolar neuron, which I haven't left myself much room to draw, but we know from our same DAVE acronym that ventral is efferent and also motor equals efferent. So we've got our lower motor neuron originating in the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord on the ventral side. And then it's gonna send nerves out via the ventral root to the appropriate arm muscle or muscles. One neuron per muscle though, cause that's how motor units work. Okay. And I'm actually gonna make this telescopically large so I have room to draw something else. So it's going to get comically big and weird looking real quick, just so that I can demonstrate something. Okay, and then I've got, sure, I guess I can be pink, why not? Usually make them blue, but whatevs. Okay, so let's do a little bit more labeling here. And then our little orange dude is And then we've got a neuromuscular junction here. So that means that these are voltage gated calcium channels. These are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. There we go. And then the green dots on the inside of the vesicles are acetylcholine. So once the action potential descends from the brain, decusates in the medulla oblongata, and then goes through, oh, I forgot to label that, that's important. I'm running out of room. Lateral corticospinal tract. Lateral corticospinal tract. Um, it's going to excite the lower motor neuron, which is going to result ultimately in calcium influx. And that results in vesicular exocytosis of our vesicles, 
Um, so they're going to release acetylcholine into the synaptic, hello, into the synaptic cleft. And that's going to bind to our nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Hooray. That lets sodium in. Which is going to, I didn't give myself enough room here. Flows over and opens voltage-gated sodium channels and causes an action potential in the sarcolemma. So the potential that's formed at the neuromuscular junction is a graded potential. The potential that results in the sarcolemma from that is an action potential. And then that is going to rush down a T-tubule, which is what I've drawn here. I'm just being lazy and I'm not drawing the two plus charge on calcium, even though I should. So just be aware that I'm the calcium here does not have a different charge from the other calcium. I am just skipping that part. Okay, so an action potential chugs down the T-tubule and there's a voltage sensor here, which gets shorter when it experiences a membrane depolarization and what that does is, no, not makes the sarcoplasmic reticulum disappear, although that would be crazy. What I was trying to do was, uh, utterly fail at drawing. There we go. So essentially the voltage sensor contracts and it opens the little calcium door and it lets the calcium out. And then the calcium can go, goes and binds troponin. And the troponin moves off the tropomyosin, revealing the F actin active site. Myosin, assuming it's got enough ATP, is going to be in the cocked position and ready to form a cross bridge, and then you get muscle contraction. So every time you decide to move or even twitch, everything I just drew is happening a lot in the required order at the required time to produce a coordinated movement. Woof. So we all take motion for granted, but we really shouldn't because 